Okay, thanks uh, so much. Uh, as you can see, uh, just as Peter, I slightly changed the title to uh, make its content a little bit more narrow, just that quantum field theory in general. But anyway, let me start by giving you the big picture, which is uh, really high energy physics uh, seen from uh, a mathematical point of view. And on the one hand side, you have uh, quantum mechanics, which is a perfectly uh, well formulated theory, as you can have seen in uh, uh, Maciej's talk or uh, Nalini's. On the other hand, you have general relativity, whose mathematical formulation also doesn't leave any doubt. It's governed by uh, Einstein equations, which are perfectly well formulated. Another matter is how to solve them and prove stability, prob stability uh, prove stability in uh, of its uh, solutions. Uh, but uh, the mathematical formulation itself is, uh, is clear. And now quantum field theory, it's something that uh, comes out of merging quantum mechanics with special relativity. And it owes its reputation to the fact that uh, despite it's very easy to construct uh, linear quantum fields uh, on a flat space time, it's incredibly hard uh, to construct its nonlinear version in four dimensions which is really uh, what described the world of uh, particle physics. So that's a problem, uh, the, non -form the formulation of nonlinear fields, that's a problem that have motivated many, many uh, uh, interesting mathematical advances in many directions, but uh, the problem of formulating it, uh, which, is really, uh, which is really well described by the, f the famous uh, Young Mills uh, uh, conjecture advertised by the Klein Mathematical uh, Institute. Well, it's still uh, it's still open, which is really a problem for uh, uh, for the mathematical description of uh, quantum field theory. And if uh, well, solving a millennial problem isn't uh, isn't enough for you, then you might be interested also in quantum gravity, which comes out of merging quantum field theory uh, with general relativity. And here, uh, even uh, it's very difficult to say how the actual conjecture uh, would look like. However, uh, if you have any uh, more or less speculative idea of how this quantum gravity would uh, would look like, very possibly it has also a low energy regime which is described by a much, much, much uh, safer uh, formalism which is linear quantum field theory uh, on fixed curve space times. Uh, so uh, it means that there are some quantum degrees of freedom but which are propagating on a Lorentzian manifold, which is a fixed one. It's not dynamical. It can, give, uh, it can be given, for instance, as a solution of uh, the equation of uh, general relativity. Uh, and then there's the ongoing question of a, of a regime where, uh, where uh, manifolds are still treated as classical degrees of freedom, like in general relativity. Uh, but they are influenced by the presence of quantum degrees of freedom. And there's a semi-classical quantum gravity, and that's something that's not quite settled, uh, but uh, there are perhaps good perspectives on defining it if you work sufficiently hard in this regime on uh, linear quantum field theory on curved space-time. And this is precisely what uh, uh, I would like to focus on uh, today. And as it happens, well, microlocal analysis is incredibly successful in quantum mechanics, as you have seen. It's uh, incredibly successful in general relativity, as you have seen a bit and you will see uh, more. So you have, so uh, for something that comes from merging out of the two, well, uh, if you already have universal uh, tools to work in both, in both situations, so uh, probably uh, you can try to, uh, to apply it to uh, this merged uh, theory. Actually, it's uh, uh, the links between my local analysis and uh, QFT on curve space time. It's uh, it's quite long. Uh, so here, for instance, you see also uh, 
a white man who quartered with uh, guarding really pining work on uh, on uh, attempts to uh, try to give a rigorous formulation of uh, uh, nonlinear fields and definitely uh, uh, linear fields. So this is the same Lance Guarding as uh, whom you might know under uh, his Michael nickname, Sharp Guarding. You know, <laughs> uh, and uh, as it happens, uh, well, it's perhaps not a total coincidence that white men uh, influence works of uh, Dusseman and Hermander. So uh, Hermander being uh, one of Guarding's uh, former students on fully integral operators and actually on this work on fully integral operators you can you can really see that influence uh, quite explicitly I'll uh, still uh, get back to that point but uh, really more recently like in the de last decade or two uh, the, there are two reasons why uh, this has really re-emerged really well, one reason is, is mathematical, is that uh, in this area there are many questions due to, uh, well, asymptotics. There are some global questions, and we have now better tools to do it together with micro local analysis. But also, there are very, very strong physical reasons. Namely, uh, from quite a time, we have less and less uh, new uh, evidence for quantum field theory uh, coming from accelerator physics. And uh, we try to look more and more uh, at cosmological observations. And it turns out that in those cosmological observations, uh, well, uh, you can expect to probe also uh, some effects uh, uh, due to, to, quantum, uh, to quantum field theory. So quantum field theory on curved space times, it's, it's nowadays really uh, 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 one of the basic ingredients of uh, what uh, uh, many many theoretical physicists do. So, uh, so uh, in in my generation, it's uh, quite normal that uh, uh, that theoretical physicists work on weird uh, spaces like uh, uh, like anti uh, the sitter, well, which uh, conforms to what you have uh, already heard that. Uh, um, more complicated geometry for a simpler analysis, and that works in theoretical uh, physics too. So why is a microlocal uh, analysis relevant to quantum field theory on the curve space-time just, uh, just, in, in just in a nutshell before, uh, before introducing the actual uh, formalism? So uh, basically what, uh, what quantum fields are, well, these are solutions of your uh, of your favorite equations like uh, the Clan Gordon equation, except that they uh, have values in operators um, on, a, on, on a Hilbert space. And a uh, fact of life is that uh, when you compute uh, scalar products, actually, you can uh, interpret them as distributions in two variables. And the distribution of two variables, they, uh, they typically uh, are Schwartz kernels of Fourier integral operators. As, as you have already seen, typically a Fourier integral operator it will have on diagonal singularities. And if you try uh, to define even the simplest nonlinear quantity of such fields, you will realize immediately that there is, that there is a problem because taking you know, pointwise uh, phi, phi square well, it means that you are taking the consigning li limit of, uh, of phi x1 times phi uh, x2. And if you know that even for uh, expectation values, well, these are, these are singular, uh, singular uh, Fourier integral operators, this, just, this is not going to happen. There is a singular part that you need somehow to, to remove. And that's one uh, ways of thinking of uh, renormalization. So that's the reason also why uh, nonlinear quantum field theory is, uh, is such a singular thing, because it will not be exclusively uh, described by uh, nonlinear equations that we are used to, but rather a strange renormalized uh, version of it. 
And uh, what microlocal analysis can help you with is characterizing precisely the singularities of those objects. And it turns out indeed that many of the problems in, uh, uh, in this domain uh, can, be, uh, can be reduced to some questions about really uh, the wave or Clang order and or uh, Dirac equation. And that's what I would like to uh, illustrate you. But first, uh, the formalism of quantum field theory, because we have already seen some, some quantum uh, mechanics on uh, some concrete L2 spaces, I should first point out what is the major difference. And the major difference is that in quantum mechanics, uh, you are describing a fixed number of particles, whereas in quantum field theory, the number of particles itself is treating as a quantum uh, quantity. It's not, uh, it's not fixed at all. Um, and the second thing is that by uniting this with special relativity, uh, what comes as a, a foundational principle is the principle of causality. Namely, you, don't, you, you not only have this kind of uh, classical quantum correspondence, but in a region of space-times which have nothing to do which, uh, with each other uh, causally, which doesn't which doesn't uh, interact with each other. If you, uh, you see there, uh, we demand that uh, operators uh, commute. And so effectively there, the, the theory is, is in a sense uh, classical. So, so this is why the structure uh, is more uh, complicated than in quantum mechanics. Actually, for linear fields, you can view quantum mechanics and uh, quantum field theory uh, as uh, a solution of the following uh, quantization problem. So uh, what you start with, you are given some real uh, vector space uh, uh, equipped with uh, a symplectic form. So uh, in the case of quantum mechanics, thinks of it as being related to Poisson brackets. Uh, and the quantization problem is to find a Hilbert space, which is, it is not given uh, a priori and uh, linear, uh, linear maps, which are called uh, quantum fields, with values in operators on that Hilbert space H, such that, well, they are, they are self-adjoint. Uh, second uh, condition, there exists a cyclic vector, uh, omega. So that means that when you act with, those, uh, uh, with all those possible uh, operators on omega, uh, well, you will uh, obtain uh, uh, a space whose uh, linear span is dense in the whole space. Uh, the interpretation of this is that you have a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, vector that describes the situation when there are no particles uh, at all, and then uh, with acting with with fields, you can you can generate kind of all possible um, configuration. That's what uh, that's really necessary in quantum field theory to have that picture of. Uh, uh, of non-fixed non a priori uh, number of uh, particles. And third uh, uh, condition, this is, uh, this is a kind of version of the classical quantum correspondence, but only for uh, polynomials of order one of, I mean, just for linear, uh, in fact, uh, quantities. Well, let's say that you, uh, uh, that you impose that uh, the commutator is precisely given by the uh, by your symplectic form that comes from the world of classical uh, physics. And now, just a remark: in the case of uh, uh, Dirac fields, this, this will work for, for instance, for Klein Gordon fields. Uh, you have to modify it slightly so that there is a plus sign, and that we are speaking of uh, a scalar product and not a symplectic uh, form. Um, okay, so. Uh, what's the basic example? The, the, the basic example if, is V is finite, uh, uh, dimensional, and, uh, and even. And then you have Stone von, Man, uh, Stone von Neumann theorem that says you that uh, your situation is actually unitarily equivalent to uh, quantum mechanics on, uh, on L2. So, uh, so uh, the content of the theory is really uh, uh, it's really just the same content that you have uh, 
when you consider uh, you know, quantum mechanics as you have seen in, uh, uh, in, in, in the other talks. So uh, that's, that's why it's probably not the best way to, uh, uh, it's, it's not the most interesting way to speak of quantum uh, mechanics, this quantization problem, because you have, you have uniqueness up to unitary uh, equivalence. But if you are uh, an infinite dim dimension, uh, then this is absolutely no longer true, and this is quite a big deal. I mean, uh, different different solutions of your quantization problem. We'd like to we like to say that these are representations because you might think of this as a kind of representation theories for those uh, for those commutation relations. Uh, so typically, well, a non non unitarily equivalent. Uh, solutions to that, uh, to that problem, they will describe very, very uh, different uh, physics. So that's, uh, so that's a big deal. Um, so because it's such a big deal, well, um, I, should try to, I should try to explain uh, where is uh, this non-uniqueness. And this non-uniqueness is visible uh, if you uh, follow uh, the following procedure uh, which sometimes is called second quantization, but it's a, but it's a kind of very, very uh, weird name. So the construction uh, goes as follows. So f first, you suppose that you are giving a complex uh, Hilbert space, and then you form out of it uh, what's called a bosonic Fox space. So uh, you take the Hilbert space C, you take the Hilbert space uh, small h, uh, then you, you sum with uh, the, symmetric, the symmetrized uh, tensor product h times h, and then h times h times h, and, uh, and so on, uh, which has actually the interpretation of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the space of uh, zero particle, one particle, two particles, uh, and so on. And uh, then you define the famous creation and annihilation operators. So uh, uh, first, uh, the creation, the, uh, the creation operator, it just uh, tensorizes uh, at each leg with a given vector h. Uh, so to, to, to each h, you assign such operator, and it has a net joint. Well, for each, you can uh, you can also uh, you can also give a very concrete uh, formula. And then if you average uh, the two of them uh, and you compute uh, their commutators, well, you will uh, get something that's actually proportional to the identity. Uh, you find that it's actually i times the imaginary part of uh, the scalar product that you started with. Uh, and so you have solved your quantization problem uh, if you say that you were interested uh, in the symplectic space uh, given by where uh, the symplectic form is this imaginary part. Uh, so let's make now an experiment. Uh, if that's one solution of this concrete quantization problem, uh, how can I construct uh, other possible solutions where uh, I can, uh, I see that I have some freedom in choosing the real part of uh, the scalar product in H. What I can do is that I can find uh, some other uh, scalar products which are parameterized by an operator uh, G. So what I can do is that I can forget the, re uh, the complex structure of the Hilbert space H. I I've completely forget it. And uh, if I have an operator uh, such that that triple scalar, that means J squared is equal to minus one, and there's a positivity condition, then I can define a new complex structure. I can def redefine what does it mean to multiply with complex number using that operator J, and I will have a different Hilbert space with this, uh, uh, with this inner product, and um, uh, 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 it will still be a solution of my, uh, of my quantization uh, problem. So, uh, there is, uh, there, there is here a freedom which is codified in this choice of uh, complex structure. Um, 
So uh, how does it apply to the situation of uh, quantum fields propagating on, uh, uh, on the Lorentzian spacetimes? Well, first of all, uh, you need to introduce uh, the classical uh, theory, which is still described by solutions of the Klein-Gordon uh, equation on some reasonable space-time. So a typical assumption, for instance, will be that uh, the space-time is globally hyperbolic, which means that there are no closed time-like curves, and uh, I have a surface uh, kind of of constant time. Well, it's not, it's, uh, it's not an intuition that works 100%, but what is important is that this surface is intersected by each maximally extended a time-like curve exactly once, so where there is no information that escapes at uh, spatial infinity. And when I will write some, some formulas, so sometimes it's very convenient to, to work in a very concrete, uh, in a very, in very concrete coordinates, and when I need coordinates, I would just assume that uh, the g is equal to minus dt square plus something Riemannian, but that depends, uh, that depends on t. What I really need, though, is that, uh, uh, so that's, for instance, implied by this assumption is that I need to uh, be able to solve a forward, backward uh, uh, forcing problem, so uh, like in, uh, like in uh, Peter talk, Peter's talk. And the other important ingredient, as we'll see, is propagation of singularity uh, theorems. But that's going to be later. So uh, what's the symplectic symplectic space that, uh, that kind of defines the, the, the theory. So you take uh, two test functions and uh, you integrate this quantity form of, uh, formed of those, uh, with those formal uh, inverses. So on test functions, actually, it's not quite a symplectic form because if you have, if you have something that looks like P uh, acting on a, on a test function, well, obviously, uh, the symplectic form will be zero. Uh, but you can quotient uh, it out, and it turns out that actually then it's a really honest, uh, non-degenerate uh, symplectic form. So that's your symplectic form. And then you apply that quantization procedure. And with that quantization procedure, it gives you something that attests uh, a linear map from test functions to, uh, to operators. And this is something that you can op uh, interpret well in the usual way as, uh, uh, as an operator valued distribution. And we prefer, we prefer to, to write phi of x rather than uh, phi smeared uh, with uh, the test function v. And because of uh, the fact that here you have this quotient, actually, well, in terms of distributions, that means that phi solves uh, the klein golden um, equation. So, uh, if we have, uh, so uh, if we have this choice of complex structure, we have a solution of our quantization problem, and we have, um, and we have quantum uh, fields. Um, actually, it's much better, uh, to, well, in order to do th then some analysis to work with complex spaces. And uh, there is a better version of, um, uh, of parameterizing our, um, our choice of complex structure. And this is, uh, this is basic functional analysis. Uh, I'll just take it for granted. Namely, uh, if you have a pair of operators uh, such that their Schwartz kernels are solutions of the klein gordon equation uh, that are positive, what well, you call there was a positivity uh, condition, and uh, their difference is related to the difference of the two propagators, so this is related to the commutation relations, uh, then there is a standard uh, way to obtain a complex, uh, a complex structure. And the interpretation of those lambda plus plus lambda minus will be uh, the space of one particle, this was correspond to to this uh, uh, to this H with a with uh, the correct uh, complex structure, uh, whereas lambda plus and lambda minus they will be interpreted as the particle content and the anti-particle um, contact. So, uh, so this is something extremely important. This means uh, uh, this means uh, before. 
if I don't fix those lambda plus and lambda minus, I don't even know what are particles and, one, and what are um, and what are particles. There is this huge uh, ambiguity. Uh, but you can. Uh, but that sounds weird, right? Like in normal life, we have a very, very clear idea of what are particles and what are antiparticles. Like if uh, today, for instance, I haven't met in the morning uh, Andrash, but his uh, less better known cousin, Anti Andrash, made of antiparticles, and we shook hands, well, we will uh, mutually annihilate and uh, we will produce so much energy that we will destroy. Uh, the whole planet. So clearly this is not something that we are witnessing every day. We have a very uh, clear idea of what are particles and antiparticles. So there must be an explanation for that. And namely there must be some concrete choice of those lambda pluses and lambda minus uh, to which we, uh, we all agree on. And in fact the explanation is that uh, we, we mostly think of uh, flat space and we mostly think of uh, the usual clang Gordon operator um, on it. And uh, we all agree that uh, whatever experiment we do in accelerator physics, it's always uh, interpreted using a canonical choice, which is the vacuum state. It's a choice of lambda plus and lambda minus on Minkowski space, which is the most symmetrical that we can imagine. And uh, so this is the kind of, well, vacuum, vacuum, right? It's, uh, it's uh, um, really, uh, it's really something that's complete, uh, that has all the symmetries of Minkowski space and therefore is, uh, uh, is the least excited uh, choice that we can imagine. And it has a very nice formula. In fact, it's, uh, it's the well-known uh, half klein golden group, except that it's have here this uh, awkward factor, but this is, uh, this is not uh, a big problem. But then if you perturb even just a little bit the space-time, well, uh, uh, we don't have all those symmetries, but still we would like to say that uh, the situation, the interpretation of particles after particles isn't very different from, uh, uh, from, this, uh, from this vacuum choice. So at small distances, uh, any reasonable physically admitted uh, lambda plus and lambda minus should resemble uh, this, uh, this vacuum state at uh, small distances. And that's precisely where my critical analysis enters uh, because it's even fundamentally, um, uh, this concept is fundamentally uh, uh, formalized uh, using uh, the reference set. So we, s we say that lambda plus and lambda minus uh, define a Hadamard state. Uh, I'm talking about uh, two-point functions. I'm talking about states. For me, it will just be really a synonym because for me, uh, state is something that, rep that represents uh, kind of um, uh, the, the basic situation that uh, that I used to describe particles and anti-particles. So uh, I say that uh, um, I have a Hadamard state if I have found lambda plus and lambda minus that fulfill all those uh, quantization conditions. And on top of that, I have a condition on the wavefront set. Uh, and that condition on the wavefront set is really, it's really, easy, to, uh, it's really easy to explain. It's just that, well, uh, solutions of the wave equations, well, they are, uh, they are possibly singular uh, on the characteristic set. So for instance, in coordinates, uh, it has uh, two uh, connected components. And I'm saying that uh, the primary from set of lambda plus uh, lambda minus, so prime, this is, uh, this is just this, uh, this expression. Uh, it's only, uh, you're only in one, uh, in one component of the characteristic set. Uh, so it turns out that uh, that condition actually uh, implies that you, can, that you can compute the wavefront set, uh, the wavefront set exactly. And well, the obvious question is, well, whether, uh, whether uh, this choice uh, satisfies the Hadamard condition, and then you will be able to interpret it as a condition that uh, 
every uh, possible uh, reasonable lambda plus and lambda minus uh, looks the same at short distances, so at high uh, frequency. Okay, so uh, uh, our half Klein Gordon group, uh, does it define a Hadamard state? Uh, well, yes, because it's uh, the half Klein Gordon group, and uh, if uh, if I suppose for a while that uh, that guy here is a pseudo-directional operator, I will just look at uh, its principal symbol and uh, use the definition of the wave front set using pseudo-differential operators in the characteristic set, and I will have it for free. Well, in reality, it's not quite a pseudo-differential uh, operator, but you can correct it by a term which is which is uh, which is irrelevant and. Uh, uh, and make a uh, true argument, uh, but uh, there's uh, a further a further problem is that uh, uh, that we very often uh, that we have in those situations is that it's um, it's a wavefront set of a Schwartz kernel. It can have some some weird directions in the wavefront set, like a zero section times something uh, non-zero. But what uh, works uh, really great uh, uh, to estimate those wavefront set is to make the connection with the theory of Fourier integral uh, operators. So the first observation, well, it's really just an observation if I if I formulate it this way, is that uh, the Hadamard condition uh, implies a uniqueness modulo operator. With smooth Schwartz curls, so, so so it's really so it's really this universality at small scales, uh, and the proof is really really simple. It's because uh, they satisfy those commutation relations. So if I have like two pairs of of uh, about two point functions, uh, their difference is universal. So. Uh, you have that lambda plus minus uh, the other lambda plus is equal to lambda minus minus the other lambda minus. And uh, the Hadamard condition says in particular that they have the joint wave front set. And therefore, uh, well, you can say that each side is smooth. And therefore, the difference uh, is smooth. Um, and moreover, uh, oh, it's not there. Um, Okay, it's 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 on another slide. Uh, so moreover, uh, 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 what consequence of Dusselmatt and Hermander's work is that you have at least existence of the of uh, parametrics for those lambda pluses and lambda uh, minuses. You actually obtain as that the difference of two two parametrices. Which satisfies uh, all the relations we we wanted, but modulo uh, modulo smoothing uh, smoothing terms, and now that theorem means that uh, the difference between this and uh, parametrices uh, constructed by Dussermat and Hermander, well, it's uh, uh, has a C infinity uh, kernel, and uh, you can uh, have for free some more information about. Uh, about the wavefront set using uh, the formalism of Fourier integral um, operators. Okay, so what are uh, kind of the physical consequences of uh, of the Hadamard condition? Well, the first uh, the first consequence is that uh, if you have a Hadamard state, you can get away with uh, those problems with defining nonlinear uh, quantities. Well, which uh, have the interpretation. Uh, of energy, if you not, uh, if you don't not only take phi square, but actually some derivatives of it, it's called a quantum stress energy tensor. What you can do is that uh, you define uh, what is called a Vick square, where before taking that on diagonal limit, you remove uh, uh, parametrics for um, uh, for that that, that satisfy uh, that Hadamard. Um, wavefront set uh, condition. So, in other words, uh, Hadamard means that uh, you have a finite energy. So, not Hadamard means that not Hadamard somewhere violating our wavefront set condition means that there is uh, infinite accumulation of energy, and hence it's a kind of quantum uh, instability 
uh, situation where uh, the quantum effects uh, produce so much energy that you can no longer say that they are uh, negligible, but they are, will truly influence the shape of the space-time uh, itself. So that, uh, so so that's a form of uh, instability. So what can you do with that? Well, there is, a, for instance, a very nice uh, theorem due to K. Radikovsky and uh, Wall, which is called the chronology prediction. Uh, theorem uh, on uh, space times with a compactly generated Cauchy horizon. I want to explain you exactly what a compactly generated Cauchy horizon and inst uh, instead uh, let me tell you what's the typical example of that. The typical example is that you have a very nice globally hyperbolic space time but in a compact region you deform it smoothly in a way so that there are time, uh, closed time-like curves. That means that you have produced a time machine uh, for instance, in a compactly supported laboratory, which is, which is very uh, reasonable. Uh, and that theorem, uh, it tells you that it's uh, impossible to satisfy uh, the Hadamard condition, which is interpreted as uh, having uh, infinite energy somewhere uh, where those... Uh, uh, where your time uh, machine starts, so uh, it's, uh, it's quite an obstruction for uh, building uh, time machines. And it doesn't, uh, and it goes really beyond, you know, uh, general, uh, general relativity. It's, uh, it's a problem of accumulation of, uh, of uh, quantum energy, regardless of what the actual uh, dynamics are and the reason well it's uh, it's it's because uh, it's because um, it's a Fourier integral operator we know everything about its wavefront set but in this uh, in this dodgy region well uh, we still can uh, propagate singularities into s and make it a really really weird form which doesn't resemble the Hadamard uh, condition uh, anymore. So perhaps this is quite d disappointing that microlocal analysis forbids you uh, <laughs> to to build uh, to build time machines. But uh, perhaps if you can quanti quantize gravity and go be beyond that regime, you will be able uh, to do something about it. Um, okay. So uh, another uh, obvious question is. Uh, um, do I have on uh, an arbitrary, say, globally hyperbolic space-time uh, the existence of such Hadamard uh, states? Because I have already told you that Dusemat and Formando have done that modulo uh, smooth terms. And indeed, you can, by a very, very cheeky uh, argument, which relies on propagation of singularities. So uh, by propagation of singularities, uh, it turns out that if you have satisfied the Hadamard condition in a strip which is a neighborhood of a Cauchy surface, then you can propagate that regularity statement everywhere and you have a Hadamard state um, everywhere. Uh, so in fact, you can assume without loss of generality that somewhere in the past, the situation is static or looks like Minkowski, whatever. Uh, there you use your, uh, you have your vacuum choice, which is this half, wa half wave or half, half Klein Gordon uh, propagator. You propagate it back, and then you pretend that you haven't, uh, and then you deform back your space-time to the original uh, one. Well, it's hardly a practical uh, device, and we and it's difficult to say anything quantitative about uh, about those thermal states. But they exist, and you can repeat the same argument as long as you have a sufficiently good uh, propagation. Uh, of singularity theorem, so you can also do this on anti deciduous space times which have a which have a time like boundary on which you need to use the b calculus and either the zero calculus or uh, or some uh, some twisted version um, of it uh, but more constructively uh, what you can uh, what you can s do is that you can uh, construct parametrices naturally as uh, Associatory uh, integrals, but um, you can uh, try to to mimic a bit the construction the construction that gives sense of those lambda pluses and lambda minuses as uh, 
propagators for uh, uh, half of the uh, Clan Gordon equation. And what it gives you uh, is the existence of Hadamard states with whose Cauchy data are uh, pseudo-dimensional um, operators. So this is so this is easy if uh, um, if in time directions everything is, is compact. It's more complicated with it's not non-compact because you need some reasonable uh, pseudo-dimensional calculus on uh, on uh, non-compact manifolds. There are various uh, types of assumptions that you can uh, make to. Uh, um, to carry it out, but what I would like to, to, to emphasize that is that it's perhaps especially uh, interesting for uh, for the wave equation, so uh, mass equals to to zero, uh, because those kinds of constructions they uh, involve a regularization of uh, the tiny problem that uh, the square root of uh, of the Laplacian is not itself a substantial operator because there is uh, obviously a problem with the smoothness. Uh, of the symbol. So what do those construction do is that they replace it somehow by uh, by something a little, little bit larger, uh, sorry, a little bit nicer at uh, at low frequency. And this has uh, the weird consequence that uh, uh, the Cauchy data, even on a static space, I mean on Minkowski space, right? Um, the Cauchy data will look differ different at uh, different uh, at different times. In a sense, uh, it will uh, there will be um, it will break a certain symmetry that we have on um, on Minkowski space, and that's uh, that's actually quite a problem if you. Uh, if you think of uh, linearized gauge theories, so in particular, uh, there's a conjecture that regards the existence of Hadamard states for uh, linearized uh, Einstein equations. And then the problem is uh, that um, linearized Einstein equations, they are not hyperbolic. You need uh, to add some term to make it hyperbolic. And then uh, you recover a true solution of the linearized Einstein equations by being in the kernel of that um, of that extra term, so you have uh, so you have a whole uh, structure. So the structure of being in some kernel of some differential operator uh, that you have to to, to preserve, and uh, it's not easy to guess that with tools like oscillatory integrals, parametrices, something that involves uh, a redefinition of your operator that depends really on time in an arbitrary way, uh, it does not, uh, it's in competition with satisfying, uh, um, well, symmetries kind of, of of the problem that comes from uh, this uh, structure of uh, linearized uh, gauge uh, theories. Uh, if, if you want to think uh, of an analogy, you would think of uh, the analogy with uh, uh, with Hodge theory, where you have all those nice uh, nice identities between uh, uh, Laplacians on the various k forms and uh, their uh, their commutation with uh, uh, with the di differential and uh, and uh, um, it's it's adjoint. There's a whole very nice structure, and in the, and in a way. Uh, in a gauge theory, it's uh, it's important to, pres to to that those lambda pluses and lambda minus they preserve uh, this uh, structure, which is something that uh, we are we are able to do as far as linear uh, Young mills, but uh, is still an, an open problem for linearized uh, Einstein equations. Perhaps uh, perhaps Peter will talk a bit about linearized equations. I don't I don't um, I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, I think after the, after, after after the break, this has to uh, this has to do with imposing a weird gauge on uh, that has some that has really some topological restriction. Uh, this does so. So this means that there are some partial results that even do not include uh, nice perturbations of Minkowski space. So this is so this is clearly uh, very serious. 
Uh, now I would like to mention also that instead of demanding a condition on the usual smooth wave front set, well, you can demand a, a stronger condition on analytical space times, which reflects the lack of uh, analyticity. And uh, the stronger condition has really some, uh, some important uh, consequences for um, theoretical considerations. So for instance, uh, there is a very nice result by Stromaya Fashion uh, von der that says that uh, if you have the Hadamard condition but with the analytic wavefront set, uh, then uh, there will be a kind of local to global effect uh, namely, uh, the linear span of uh, uh, well expression that involves uh, fields acting on a cyclic uh, on a cyclic vector, they will be dense even if uh, you don't take all possible test functions in, in a whole space time. But even if you take only uh, an arbitrarily small uh, open open region, and this is this is uh, a bit puzzling because it means that the whole content of the theory. Uh, regardless of any, you know, uh, causality, it's, uh, uh, it's contained in an arbitrarily small, uh, uh, compact, uh, uh, sorry, open region, uh, which uh, could be well, you know, in the interior of, uh, of, uh, of a black hole, which is, uh, which is really, really strange and actually have some, have some implication for, uh, uh, for concepts such as uh, entropy. Um, uh, so what's, what's the general mechanism? Well, the general mechanism is that uh, uh, if you want to say that something in this in the Hilbert space, well, you will rather uh, uh, translate it into the language of uh, some scalar products that are equal zero. And here, scalar products, well, they are actually, they will be actually solutions of uh, uh, in uh, in many many spatial uh, space time variables. Uh, so uh, if you uh, if you can say things uh, such as unique continuation theorems for those kinds of solution of the Klein Gordon equation, uh, this will uh, enable you the reasoning that that leads to those local to global phenomena. So we use this uh, more refined version of this, uh, for instance, on. Uh, the boundary of Fanti, uh, the sitter uh, space. Um, and so let me now, now that we know that those objects exist and so on, let me get back uh, to the 60s. And uh, whatever your favorite cliche of the 60s is, um, doing quantum field theory on curved space time at that time, uh, well, it wouldn't bring you a Fortune is some is kind of hobby that you can do in uh, your ivory tower, and the reason is that uh, at that time uh, physicists believed that because we uh, fundamentally we have imposed uh, causality, we have universal short distance behavior, and of course we have finite speed of propagation. Well, uh, everything should look locally, really, as uh, uh, as on flat space, and we do not really expect anything, uh, anything global going on, uh, different than the usual propagation of you know classical solutions of uh, the um, the Klein-Gordon equation. But you know that uh, it turns out to be radically uh, false uh, due to discoveries of Uno or Hawking and uh, other authors who have predicted particle creation um, on curved space-times, uh, which is linked to the fact that not everything is so global as it looks, uh, because you have, for instance, those positivity properties of uh, uh, Hadamard two-point functions, which is indeed a very, uh, a very much global conditions, and they enter um, and they enter in various uh, moments, uh, which leads to uh, quantum effects uh, induced by geometry. Now, if you're curious, that's a fragment of, uh, uh, of Hawking's original work on, uh, on what is now called Hawking radiation. And it's, uh, it's a paper in, uh, in, in CMP, but uh, 
even in this, uh, even in those few lines which are particularly dense uh, uh, with formulas, uh, you can see that it's not really a theorem. Uh, it's uh, it's an incredibly uh, good shot in the dark, but it's far from being kind of an explanation of uh, uh, of a phenomena which well. Uh, um, which relates to general relativity, quantum fields, and what's so surprising, uh, also uh, thermodynamics. So uh, in the uh, time that I have, I would like to, I would like to uh, explain you this a little bit and what's the current status in uh, understanding that from a mathematical uh, perspective. So uh, first, what I will need is some definition from um, that comes really from a completely, completely different world, which is the world of uh, statistical mechanics and thermal uh, dynamics. And in thermal dynamics, well, the general rule is that uh, it's if you have some kind of concepts, I uh, refer always to some time evolution. So that's why it's. Uh, uh, it's quite convenient to uh, work rather with Cauchy data rather than with the two-point functions uh, themselves. So there, there is a, if you think that well, uh, lambda pluses and lambda minuses are uh, are operators. Of course, the Cauchy data of them will be operators acting on Cauchy data. So matrices, two by two matrices of um, of operators, and you have. Uh, uh, clearer definition of what an evolution is in the case where uh, when you have a time-like killing vector field, let's call it uh, let's call it dt, and uh, if things are not too bad, then uh, you can uh, rewrite your Klein-Golden equation as an evolution uh, equation. Of course, so for instance, the generator uh, will look something like that on. Um, on Minkowski space, and in this uh, in, in this evolution picture, the data of uh, the vacuum two-point function, uh, the one on which everyone agrees, are very simple. These are simply uh, spectral projections of um, of uh, on the right and left part of the spectrum of of H. So so telling what in a static situation, uh, telling what particles and antiparticles are. Well, it's pretty much easy because you have uh, you have spectral spectral theory. But there is uh, another choice uh, that uh, appears in the context of um, thermodynamics, and uh, which minimizes what uh, a functional that kind of measure how much the system is disordered, which is called uh, the von Neumann entropy, and those minimizers. Uh, they uh, they turn out to to be what we call thermal states, in which we replace uh, the spectral projection by a kind of uh, exponential. So actually, uh, um, the the two of them they differ by term, which is smoothing. So uh, uh, for that reason, thermal states on the uh, in this simple situation they are. Uh, there are Hadamard states, and it's uh, what's really crucial is that we started with a time-like killing vector field. If you if you would try to define those concepts, you know, you, using uh, your spatial your spatial directions, you would not be able uh, to um, to separate uh, the two connected components of uh, the characteristic set of um, the, um, the wave equation. And now, uh, Uno's famous uh, discovery, well, it's a very simple computation on uh, Minkowski space. So I would consider Minkowski space, uh, in a weird way, I would, uh, uh, I would write ds and not dt, because uh, this, will, this coordinate s, it will badly generalize to black hole space times. Um, so uh, it's a killing vector field that is time-like, but uh, what uh, we also have are other uh, killing vector fields. So, for instance, uh, in a wedge, uh, in this wedge region, 
So uh, it's kind of a right wedge in Minkowski uh, space. Uh, you have another uh, equally nice time like uh, killing vector field. And um, the, re the result that is due to uh, fooling Davis and Ono is that, uh, well, uh, you have this distinguished vacuum state, uh, vacuum state with respect to, to, to the S. That's the perfectly natural choice that we are inclined to make and agree on. But uh, in uh, the wedge region, uh, it restricts actually uh, to the thermal state with respect to the other killing vector field. And this other killing vector field, it's uh, the generator uh, it's the generator of boosts in Minkowski space, which means that uh, the trajectories are the trajectories of an accelerator, uh, of an uniformly accelerated observer. So the consequence sounds quite dramatical. Namely, if you are an accelerated observer, you will see suddenly that uh, there, there are some uh, thermal effects. You will see, uh, you will see uh, particles that... Uh, at a temperature which is related to uh, parameter uh, parameter k. Uh, oh, the parameter k uh, should be really in front of, of x. So, uh, so it's equal to one. Uh, so there is so sorry, there is no uh, no alpha and there is no k if this is just one. And if you multiply it by something, that it will it will enter uh, uh, the, the the temperature. And the, exp the, the explanation of, of this is, uh, um, um, well, it's, um, it's a computation, uh, but perhaps a computation which uh, generalizes quite well to, then to, to black hole space-time is to make a few change of coordinates uh, in which ds will look like that, and the other time like killing vector field will look like that. So there is a, an exponential change of coordinates uh, between the two, and now if you uh, if you compare uh, those uh, by solutions in terms of some characteristic data at u equals uh, zero and v equals uh, zero, well, uh, what will appear naturally uh, uh, for uh, for instance for the vacuum state will be spectral projections of the coordinate uh, du. And then there is a magical identity that links the generator of dilation and the generator of, uh, uh, um, of translations, well, which looks quite miraculous because uh, those objects don't have anything to do with each other. But here, because it's a spectral projection, the homogeneities are, uh, are quite okay. And there is a special choice of that uh, function which makes that work and which involves this uh, um, this exponential. So this is something that you can that you can explain uh, uh, nicely in terms of uh, in terms of characteristic data for a solution of the klang uh equation. Uh, but now on Schwarzschild uh, spacetime, the story is that uh, the exterior of uh, of the black hole. You think of this as something that generalizes this wedge region. Uh, M1. There's a form of the metric when when there is some uh, when there is some dt, and it turns out that by uh, uh, some nice change of coordinates, you can extend it to to a region that includes the interior of um, um, of the black hole. And what happens is that uh, the uh, the vector uh, dt, which is our uh, which are uh, which is our obvious, you know, um, reference uh, vector field in the exterior uh, region. Well, it's not uh, it's not time like everywhere uh, in the whole of um, in the whole of M. So um, the problem is that uh, we no no longer even have this ds uh, coordinate to say what will be a what will be a vacuum state, and this is uh, why we need. Uh, 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 we need to appeal uh, just to symmetries and uh, to uh, um, to the Hadamard um, con condition. 
And it turns out that uh, whereas in this uh, Unruh effect, uh, you could have generated uh, different temperatures just by choosing your killing, just by rescaling your vector field. Here, this temperature is uh, linked to uh, to the geometry of uh, um, of uh, the spacetime. Uh, so, what was proved recently is that uh, there there exists. Uh, uh, something that replaces the vacuum in that situation. It's called a, a harder Hawking Israel state. And uh, it's characterized by the property of, of well, being maximally symmetric. It has all the symmetries of the space time and it satisfies the Hadamard uh, condition. And it turns out that uh, it's also a thermal state with respect to uh, the obvious vector field in the, uh, uh, in the exterior. Uh, region. It's actually conjectured that it's, uh, that it's more, that it's an analytic uh, Hadamard state. So it's, it provides um, a, a kind of uh, uh, ex explanation of, uh, um, of Hawking's original uh, idea that uh, uh, for geometrical uh, reasons, uh, we, the observers outside of the black hole, uh, we will see uh, we will see um, uh, a thermal state. Uh, what we do not know, so that's the last thing uh, I will tell, perhaps, uh, is what happens then uh, on Kerr. So Kerr uh, is it's a more realistic description of the black hole than uh, Schwarzschild. It's uh, it's a rotating black hole uh, and. Uh, then the problem is that the killing vector dt is not everywhere, it's not everywhere uh, time-like. So uh, you're, you cannot really mimic this construction and try to first have a, have a thermal state with respect to dt and then try to extend it uh, because if, even in the exterior region because where dt is not time-like, it will uh, violate uh, uh, the Hadamard condition. There is another uh, uh, killing vector field which is time-like in some region, but that doesn't help uh, either. And uh, the conjecture is that there exists no maximally symmetric Hadamard state on the whole Kruskal extension, uh, if you want to uh, to call it that way, uh, on Kerr's uh, on Kerr uh, space-time. And uh, the, the, the reason for this will be that imposing symmetries will impose uh, the fact that it's, uh, that it's uh, thermal and therefore it's not Hadamard because of the killing field being not everywhere uh, um, time-like. So it, it is conjectured instead that there, is a, that there is a Hadamard state in the union of the exterior and interior of uh, the Kerr uh, black hole, which preserves, um, oh, sorry, which is, uh, which is not really exactly thermal, but has the same asymptotic data as a thermal state uh, at what we call uh, uh, the past uh, event uh, horizon. And this is really something that deserves uh, the name final state conjecture, because uh, it's really a conjecture about what's the quantum, final quantum state that emerged from, uh, from the collapse into uh, um, a, a black hole. So because now uh, this, is, uh, this is a question where we fix something really asymptotically at, at infinity, it's a question of uh, having a scattering theory on black hole spacetimes, which is uh, sufficiently good uh, to deal with the kind of data that we have, but more importantly, for me, you can, you can control wave front set and regularity statements uh, at finite times from those knowledge uh, of the scattering, uh, scattering data. So there have been many works uh, uh, on construction of Hadamard from scattering data using various, uh, using various uh, uh, techniques in particular that, that were uh, presented in some, some other talks. There, the conjecture is all for Schwarzschild. Um, you have an ongoing work on progress 
for Dirac fields where the problem is slightly easier because of the lack of what we call uh, super regions. Um, this, is, uh, this is perhaps a uh, technical, uh, technical thing. And uh, there are many ongoing works having on scattering on, on Kerr and, uh, and Kerr, uh, this, the, this iter. And finally, I would like to, 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 to mention that uh, instead of uh, on focusing yourself on the final state, you can try to find a more phenomenological description of, of uh, the Hawking uh, radiation when you where you treat the collapse very seriously you send uh, you send beams from uh, uh, from minus uh, infinity they bounce off partially from uh, um, the boundary of the collapsing star and uh, and an observer at future infinity uh, is supposed to see uh, to see a thermal state so uh, this approach was uh, was developed by, uh, among others, by Bachelot, Efner, and uh, and and Drouot. But very curiously, the case of uh, Klein-Gordon fields on Kerr spacetime is open, and actually would uh, 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 the so the conjecture is qu requires quite similar tools from scattering theory and uh, and micro local um, analysis. What's so interesting about this is that. Uh, Whenever you solve the conjecture, uh, you uh, you have to bypass those uh, uh, those no go uh, those no go theorems, and you have to make some physical output about how you break uh, those uh, symmetries. Okay, uh, there's some there's some other developments I haven't uh, I haven't even mentioned, <laughs> and uh, some further better reading as well. Thank you. So, so there are some, so there are some, uh, some connections which uh, are still quite mysterious to me. So, uh, uh, what what appears on those results and con conjectures? Oh, sorry, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the surface, the surface gravity of uh, of the horizon, which uh, uh, which also plays an important role in the. In the description of the asymptotic structure of uh, of the biacoustic flow on black hole uh, on black hole space times, so I would uh, how exact what is was what's the exact relation with this form of the metric? I don't really I don't really know, but uh, this certainly is something that points towards uh, what you say. So, um, um, uh, it depends a little bit. It's it depends a little bit um, what you're what you're asking for. So, uh, uh, there are some techniques for uh, constructing two-point functions which are uh, which connect to some uh, to some elliptic problem, but that's more uh, but that's more like. Um, um, that's more like 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 a, okay. So per perhaps I, I answer this question like that. If you if you think what is the best analog of uh, elliptic inverses uh, in the Lorentzian setting and how they uh, how they appear in uh, in quantum field theory? 
well, this is uh, uh, this is actually uh, uh, something on the slides that I that I haven't shown, and this uh, and this is something that we call the Feynman the Feynman propagator. So uh, um, the closest that uh, that we have to the elliptic setting is this is this Feynman is this Feynman propagator, and uh, its relation to uh, um, to two-point function is a little bit it's a little bit delicate because uh, mm, uh, two-point functions which satisfies nice properties really they typically well uh, emerge from concrete scattering data or concrete data at some at some finite times whereas uh, this uh, this Feynman inverse is really a completely global uh, inverse so 